Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sound and Image Lab. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. It is a show about how artists use technology to tell story, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. We have a really special episode today. We're focusing on a new movie called Summertime. Uh, this is a pretty remarkable film uh, that uh, is in theaters right now, and I hope you get a chance to see it. Before we dive in and have a conversation with the filmmakers, let's take a listen to the trailer. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got the legendary Anubis and Ra. There's no one here, Ra. It's just us. Have you forgotten where we are? What kind of crazy dope magic happens in this city every day? $15. In this economy, do you know what I can buy was $15? No. 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 <laughs> Hell no. Why are you here? Because this city needs me. There's literally a street that has stars in it with people's names. $15 to get me a new outfit from the four-star veteran thrift store down the street. I can make chicken Alfredo for dinner for around $14.70. Purchase shampoo, conditioner, and leaving for Marshalls at around $13.40. Lift home for $6.89. Drive me to my night clothes. Flop on my bed. Open on my laptop. Log on to Yelp and write how ridiculous these prices are. Ooh. Take a little bit, baby. Not even depressed. Maybe we just hungry. <laughs> so I hope you got a sense from the trailer that this is a really special film. It is a movie made by Carlos Lopez Estrada, and it is focusing on the work of a number of young spoken word poets in the Los Angeles area. It came out of a, a program that Carlos saw with an organization called Get Lit, a live performance of some of these poems and some of this poetry from these young poets. And he decided that this would make an interesting movie. So he uh, developed the script and raised the financing and went out and made this movie that opened at the Sundance Film Festival. And now it is at a theater near you. So this conversation was uh, an internal Dolby employee conversation that we had for a program called Dolby at Home. But we had so much fun with it that I thought that I would bring it to you as a Dolby Institute podcast episode. So if it sounds a little odd, that's uh, that's why this was an internal kind of a kind of a Zoom uh, conversation that we had uh, that we broadcast live. And so um, the way this conversation works is I spend the first few minutes in conversation with Carlos and the executive producer of the film, Kelly Marie Tran. And then we bring on two of the poets whose work is featured in the film, uh, Marcus James and Tyrus Winter. So you'll, uh, you'll hear the four of us chatting about the film. So I, I just want to introduce Carlos and Kelly. Uh, Carlos Lopez Estrada is no stranger to Dolby. He directed the film Blind Spotting, which received the Dolby Institute Fellowship in 2018, which allowed them to um, mix the film and Dolby Atmos. It premiered at Sundance and was acquired by Lionsgate. And if you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic, uh, just a really wonderful movie that you should absolutely see. Carlos was nominated by the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, for Outstanding Directorial Achievement for a First Time Filmmaker for Blind Spotting. Summertime uh, is, his, uh, is, is the second film that he shot. Uh, that premiered at Sundance. And uh, and then he joined the uh, Disney organization and he directed Raya and the Last Dragon. So he has had a remarkably busy couple of years and in fact is now working on a live action adaptation of Robin Hood for Disney. Kelly Marie Tran is the executive producer of the film. And you probably recognize Kelly for her work as, a, as an actor. She portrayed Rose Tico, the resistance maintenance worker in Star Wars episode uh, eight, The Last Jedi, and episode nine, The Rise of Skywalker. She was also in Raya and the Last Dragon, which is how she met Carlos. 
and he got her involved uh, in summertime as the executive producer. So uh, let's dive into this conversation that I had with these uh, remarkable filmmakers about this film. Uh, you're gonna, we're going to join the conversation right as I'm asking uh, Kelly how she got involved with the film. So here it goes. So, uh, Carlos, I think we got a, we got a, a good kind of sense of uh, from that video about sort of how you first got involved with Summertime and your experience seeing the poets at Get Lit. But maybe, Kelly, can you fill, in, fill us in on a little bit about uh, how you got involved in this, this madness of this amazing wow. project? while working on Red and Last Dragon. And um, we did, one of our last press events was right when uh, theaters were opening again and we introduced the movie at the El Cap. It was one of the first movies to come back. Um, and then we had dinner and Carlos and I were just talking about um, the types of things that we wanted to work on and, and the types of um, things that were important to us. And I feel like we really connected um, and Carlos sent me a link to Summertime without much of an explanation. Um, and I watched it and completely fell in love with the film and, and the poets and have since then really had the privilege of getting to know every single one of them. And it's been an absolute joy. That's, that's amazing. I think before we got started, I, I, I mentioned that I had kind of a similar reaction to you. Like they sent me the link and I love that the, the password to the link was $15. That was just perfect. Um, but I, you know, it had been a bad day and I was kind of like, uh, I have to watch, the, but it totally charmed me within five minutes. I was on board. I love this movie so much. It's such a remarkable achievement. So Carlos, like you, you know, blind spotting obviously was scripted. You had worked with, uh, David Diggs and Rafael Casal on that, on that film. This was just like, what a chaotic free for all. How did you approach it? How did you figure out who the poets were going to be? How did you kind of structure figure out what the story was going to be and this kind of wonderful structure that you lit on, which is, you know, we follow a, follow one person for a while and then it kind of gets handed off like a baton to another and to another. And tell us how that structure came together and, and how you gave it some shape. Um, it really all began at that showcase that I saw about two and a half years ago. And it was really structured like the movie is. It was an evening of like 90 minutes where the 27 poets that you see in the movie just would go one after the other, would introduce themselves, would give you like a one one piece like intro on who they are and how they got there, and then they would perform their piece. Um, and I just remember walking out of that showcase feeling like I had just seen something that I wasn't going to forget about in a long, long time. Um, and it was so hard to describe because, I mean, I'm obviously because of David, because of Rafa, because of my background in music, I I wasn't a complete stranger to the spoken word, word world. Um, but definitely, I just hadn't experienced what I did that day. Um, so I guess a long story short is that I was thinking about it so much, and I think the deciding factor for me to come back to the organization was I just felt like what that performance had done for me was something that was really important and really profound and I it felt unfair that not enough not more people had access to this kind of experience so without really knowing what it would become or how it would take shape I came back and I, I I told the, the woman who runs the organization, I said, look, I have this idea. I'm not really sure what it is fully, but I think that we can adapt this into some kind of movie experience. And it's probably going to be indie and it's probably going to be like really, really rough around the edges. But I would love for the poets to write it and to perform in it, like to make it their movie. And anyway, that was that was sort of like the seed that very quickly evolved into a gigantic oak tree with sprawling branches that now embrace all of us together as one big family. Oh my gosh, that's a great way to put it. That's absolutely perfect. Tell me a little bit more about again. Was it like that twenty-seven? That group of twenty-seven is that the twenty-seven that's in the film now, or how did you like? 
the, the process of actually piecing this together and, and coming up with this through line of narrative. Talk to me about that. Yeah, well, the the group that I got to see was already sort of like precast because these were sort of like the the all stars of Get Lit, which is the name of the the nonprofit that I met them through. And because the way they get lit, they essentially offer English curriculum to high schools all around um, LAUSD, which is the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and they work with all these different high schools throughout the year, um, getting people, getting students excited about literature, about English, about poetry. So because of that makeup, they they're they're sort of like the population of this nonprofit is so diverse. There's people from every single neighborhood in LA, as far east, as far west, south, ba valley, everywhere in between. Um, so this group was already you were hearing stories all about sort of like their relationship to their community, their environment, their families, LA themselves, um, as different as could be, but it was all young people talking about existing in this city in 2019 at the time, which, which sort of like put them all together into this beautiful package. And that was really sort of like how the, the idea of, what the movie could look like. It, we said it would be one day in LA, it would follow characters from point A to point B, and then they would pass on the torch to the next group. Uh, we would find ways for some of them to stick around. Some of them would just make like one-off interactions. And the only structure that this would have is that these are all young people existing in LA on the same day. Uh, and then from there on, we kind of like opened up the door for the poets to bring in. Essentially, we told them, you're going to write and you're going to star in your own scene. Uh, what do you want to talk about? Like, what is important to you today? And then from then on, it was uh, madness. What was the process of shooting the film? Like, was it pretty linear or how did it, how did it, all, how did it all go? Did you start in Venice and work your way downtown or how, 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 did, how did the process kind of work itself out? We shot it. I I wish we could have shot it linearly like that. Um, but you know, unfortunately, we did not. It was the word that we keep using as as we're bringing this man into the world is just chaotic. And it was it was a good, beautiful, uh, artistic chaos, but definitely chaos. Just because I guess the other element that I haven't spoken about is the fact that. Because most of the poets were graduating high school, not all of them, some of them are older, but the, the great majority of them were graduating high school, we had a real tight timeline. We had the summer, and then in the fall, they were all going across the U.S., they were starting jobs, they were just, we wouldn't have access to this group any other time, or at least, you know, for another year, and who knows what would happen in that year. Actually... <laughs> Now, looking backwards, I'm so glad that we didn't wait a year because we would probably be shooting it right now. Um, so we decided to go for it, and that just meant that over a summer workshop, over four months, we would have to devise, construct, write, pre-produce, and shoot the movie. Um, and for some, yeah, for some insane reason, uh, our our financiers thought that that was an exciting challenge and that it would it would it would give us the chance to to capture this energy that exists in this community and honestly i think it did i think had we done it the traditional way had we like rehearsed this and cast this and like had a year to write it it would have been something very different that doesn't feel quite as alive so anyway that's the not so short answer yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a great explanation, and I I appreciate you saying like because I thought like oh there's like the Mike Lee way of doing this, which is like you kind of bring the actors in, and you workshop it, and you spend a year kind of figuring out what the script and the story is going to be. But yeah, I think it 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 has that great sense of a of immediacy to it as well. So Kelly, for both you and Carlos, uh, I understand from something that I read that. You've now had a little bit of experience with uh, with uh, spoken word poetry. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Carlos and I both went through what we're calling a poetry boot camp, 
um, <laughs> and a few of the poets from Summertime essentially, yeah, took us through a poetry course. And by the end of it, we were performing our own poems, which was absolutely horrifying and also one of the best experiences ever. I won't, I won't put you on the spot by asking you to, to perform, but just give, give us a little sense of like, what, what were your, it's the, I think the thing that's so amazing is that these, these, these poets and the poetry that are presented in this film, it's so personal. So maybe just tell us what, what was the topic of your poems? Well, I don't want to put Kelly on the spot, but if you all follow our summertime Instagram at summertime movie 2021, you can actually see a live recording of Kelly performing her um, beautiful, beautiful poem. Uh, sorry, Kelly, you can just wanted to make sure. I didn't want to deprive our, our friends at Dolby from, having that experience. I haven't even seen that, but I trust, I trust Carlos that it's good. <laughs> so what was your poem about, Kelly? It's funny. It was about me sort of being in this place of transition um, and feeling like I'm never reaching my destination, like I'm always evolving and sort of like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> um, which I'm having trouble talking about because it feels really personal at the moment. <laughs> Um, but I think that's something that's so special about this community and about poetry and the way in which this community is able to use words to process their own trauma and their own pain. That was an experience that I definitely had going through this course. And I think that the more you can be personal and brave and vulnerable, the better um, the poem is. So I will let you all be the judge of that if you go to the Summertime Instagram at Summertime Movie 2021. <laughs> Carlos, what have you done to me? Let's bring on Marcus and Tyrus. Um, I'll just give a little short uh, uh, bios uh, for them to, to join us. Marcus, uh, James, and I just want to acknowledge that Marcus is a last minute addition. He graciously agreed to jump in on about 10 minutes notice and uh, join us for this conversation. Marcus is uh, really one of the, the folks who has helped develop a lot of the, the poets working with them on their work and their style. Uh, and has really been a, a huge part of the process of developing this film. And, and Carlos can expand on this, but worked on the book uh, that's a companion piece uh, to, the, to the film. And, and if, if you have very sharp eyes, uh, Carlos is holding it up there. If you have very sharp eyes, uh, Marcus uh, makes uh, a couple of delightful cameos as, uh, as the Lyft driver who uh, appears a couple of times in the film. Oh, my God, Carlos. Carlos is holding up some, some artwork of him and Kelly Marie Tran. Um, and then Tyrus, uh, you know, I really don't need to introduce Tyrus because if you watch the film, he is a force of nature and heavily featured on the poster, as you see behind Carlos there. But I'm going to read this introduction and I'm going to read it because I don't want to mess it up. This is the most amazingly delightful introduction I have ever read about an artist ever. So here goes. Tyrus Winter, born to be an artist, aspires to be a legend. Tyrus expresses himself through poetry, drawing and painting. He is the winner of the international Why I Rise poetry competition, and his work has been featured online and in multiple publications. Uh, his team took first place in the 2019 Classic Slam poetry competition. And uh, as a sentient being, Ty Tyrus's passion is to inspire others to be vulnerable and to be themselves. For in vulnerability, there lies honesty and the seeds to create poetry for healing. He works as a graphic designer and social media coordinator for Get Lit. I am thrilled to welcome Marcus and Tyrus to join us for the rest of this conversation. Hello. Oh my God, the bio is so old. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so wonderful. I love it. I love it. So Marcus, uh, you are sorry, go ahead, like Carlos, please. No, sorry. I, I was just going to say, um, uh, Marcus has been, as you mentioned, he's been a coach at Get Lit. He was actually Tyrus's coach on the Poetry Slam that I first was introduced to uh, to Tyrus on. So thank you, Marcus, for your work. Uh, and in addition to being instrumental in the movie, he's been running our social impact campaign, which you know he can tell you more about, but includes free community screenings that we're doing. This book that I was showing a second ago, as well as many, many other things. So, Marx is multi talented and wonderful. Thank you. So kind. Well, I think that oh. tees up a, a, good, a good question, which is uh, for both you, uh, Marcus and Tyrus, how did you get involved in Get Lit? And what kind of 
what what led you to explore spoken word poetry as an art form and a, a form of expression for you? Um, there was a creative writing class that came to my school and I was 16 and I remember seeing a showcase and at the showcase it was actually Markeisha and I left that showcase feeling like super just torn apart. She had done a poem about her father and about home and about family and I was just like going through so much that I didn't know that I needed to hear that and so when I ran back into like my art room I was like painting with the art club my art teacher was like, I think you need to join poetry. I was like, no. And it's <laughs> a year, fast forward a year later, I ended up joining the class and it just ended up being life changing. I was able to really discover who I was as a person and be more honest with myself and grow into who I wanted to be and who I wanted to see and depict in the world. And that led me to be more vivacious with my fashion and creative and other aspects. So. I'm ever so grateful to just poetry and everything that it has brought into my life. So, hey. Nice. Yeah. Um, it's so wild that you say that Markeisha was at your show because uh, Markeisha was at my show too. So I was in high school um, and I ditched class so I could go see the poetry showcase. Um, and Markeisha and Raul were there. And so was Walter, actually. Markeisha, Raul, and Walter, all three huge figures in the film. Uh, and they just blew my mind. And it was really cool because it was the first time uh, I had secretly liked poetry at this point. But, like, it's not very cool to like poetry when you're in high school, uh, at least at my high school. Uh, and then these folks came through and I was like, no, these people are cool. Um, and, you know, everybody's snapping for them. Everybody wants to take pictures with them. And I'm like, OK, like, it feels OK to like poetry. Um, and then from there, I started going to open mics around my neighborhood uh, and then actually left college my second year of college uh, I was playing UCSB and I came back because I was like I want to try to do one year of just poetry uh, so I went to community college for that year and I joined Get Lit um, and I started off as one of their poets and then uh, realized that I liked coaching a lot more so then I became a coach for quite a bit of time and was very lucky to work with Tyrus and coach Tyrus amongst a bunch of other students that I got to work with um, Tyrus B Ty came in really talented already, though. I, I can't even lie. <laughs> like, <laughs> he knew what he was doing. We just had to do a little little stuff on the edges. But for the most part, he knew what he was doing. Um, and, yeah, and from there, just got involved with Get Lit in that aspect. So definitely uh, started off as one of their poets and then kind of turned into one of the teachers and one of their teaching artists. Uh, and, yeah, now I just uh, – now I get to do spoken word all the time and it's honestly kind of crazy never in my life would i have thought i could like make this a career so yeah that's that's my road in poetry that is awesome I, i'm just kind of, i'm curious marcus like what is so what does it mean to coach poets and kind of help them develop their their poetry and their voice how do you do that like what are you looking for and what do you try to bring out in them maybe you can use tyrus as a case study what did, how did you how did you work with him and develop this voice so, okay, if we're using Tyrus as a case study, the thing that happened with Tyrus was so helpful was Tyrus already came in having read. Um, that's like the number one thing that we ask poets is like, we really, really want you to read poetry because the more you read, like the more, the better the writing becomes. And so Tyrus came in having read Olivia Gatwood, having read all these poets, like he knew what was going on. So his writing was already like very much up here. Um, and then the other thing that was super dope about Tyrus was that Tyrus doesn't really care what people think about him. Um, so because of that, it made it way easy to coach him. It made it way easy for us to be like, okay, what if you try it this way? Or what if you like try to use your intonation this way? Um, but I guess a more succinct answer is because Tyrus is like, Tyrus is an outlier and should not be counted. Is like the way that I would say it. <laughs> uh, but for an average person who comes through and is like, I've never done poetry before. Uh, the number one thing we ask them to, you know, read poets that they'd like following that, more than anything, you know, uh, I'm a firm believer in the idea of write what you know. So, you know, write about your neighborhood, write about your family, write about the people that you love, about the people you don't love, you know, write about all of these things. Uh, and then from there, if you're writing about stuff that you know and stuff that already means stuff to you, uh, it becomes a lot easier to perform it because uh, you love these things. Uh, so then it's kind of similar to like an acting class, but the thing that's a little more difficult is that you're talking about stuff that's super personal 
Uh, and so a big part of what me and Hannah Harris did, just because she was also Tyrus's coach as well, uh, a big part of what we would do is like really, really focus on what is the key emotion that you want to take away from this? You know, do you want this to be something that is uh, empowering? Do you want this to be something that is maybe a little lower on tone? You know, things of that nature. Uh, and like the biggest thing is just talking to the poet and figuring out what they want. And then once you know that, we can kind of help guide them in that direction. Amazing. Amazing. Marcus was also uh, one of our coaches on Kelly and I's boot camp. So uh, he uh, he turned us into poets. Yeah, it was easy. It was, well, it was easy with Kelly. Carl, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carlos, well, I, were, want, I, were Carlos I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, you know, obviously, the poets in the films, they're, they're, they're great performers, um, but they're not actors. Uh, and for most of you, I presume, Tyrus, was this your first time acting uh, for camera in, in, a, in a film? It was, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Carlos, tell us, about that, uh, tell us about that process of, you know, not only were you trying to basically structure this very non, non-traditional film, but you're also working with non-professional actors. And, like, how did you kind of... The, the performances are so raw and so real. And how did you set up the atmosphere on set to achieve that? Well, I think that why the poetry that I saw that day was so impactful is because even though the poets, yes, had not taken, some of them had, but had not taken like, you know, professional acting classes or had that experience, they had for years most of them had been practicing at standing in front of a crowd, figuring out what it takes to establish a connection, figuring out how to use their voice, figuring out how to use their body, um, how, to, how to emote in a way that feels truthful. Um, and because the poetry that they're performing, it's fun, it's fast, uh, it's technical, it's very highly technical. Like they, they think about their cadence and they think about their pauses and they think about their delivery. And it's like, try this one. Uh, you like the coaching that Marcus does. It's essentially acting, acting coaching. Like y you are thinking about all of the things that an actor should be thinking about. And because of the poems are so deeply personal when they, when it works, for them, like it really works. It really transports you. You really, you really sort of like forget the fact that you're watching a performance, and it just feels like someone's, you know, opening their heart up to you. So, for that reason, it wasn't really as 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 hard of, of of a challenge as I think it may seem when you just read like these are first time actors. Yes, this is the first time in front of a movie camera, and we had to work with them to make sure they understood. Um, what marks were and how focus worked to make sure that, you know, we could just have all those things in mind. Uh, also, just the endurance that it takes to perform a poem 30 times in a day as opposed to just once in an evening. So it was all the technical stuff that, honestly, you can learn in, in two days, but all the all the much more profound abstract stuff that goes around acting, they had they had already so dialed down so it, it wasn't it it really was just a matter of adapting what they were already doing to uh doing it in front of a camera yeah i'm glad that you brought up um how you know how physical spoken word poetry is that was not something that i'd really thought about before seeing the film and you know obviously you know mila <clears throat> mila's piece hey i'm gay on the metro bus like extremely physical Tyrus, everything you do in this movie is so incredibly physical and so incredibly expressive. And I just, I, I love that. I mean, you know, even during your, your ode to Yelp, when you, you, you fake your choking fit on the floor, like it's just an amazingly, remarkably physically expressive performance. I hadn't even thought about that, but you're totally right. Tyrus, you're, you should be like a 21st century physical comedian. You're, you're so physically gifted. We uh, we went to Disneyland two days ago uh, with with all the poets, and Tyrus started started a series on on his Instagram of 
uh, doing the splits in as many places in Disneyland as he could. And he just had everyone watching and totally, totally captivated. It was an experience. I'm excited for uh, season two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yes, yes. Uh, I want to ask you all, but specifically Carlos, about about tone. Um, Kelly, one of the things that you said a few minutes ago was, you know, the, that the, the spoken word poetry, I think you used the words trauma and pain about, you know, that this is something that you get to express and explore through this poetry. And a lot of the poetry in the film is, exp I mean, it's expressing really painful, powerful emotions. Um, you guys both mentioned Mar uh, Markeisha, like her poem, Shallow, is just like, I was bawling by the end of it. It was just wrecked. And then, you know, Tyrus, Home Part 2, you know, which you deliver into a cell phone about being homeless, like, it's just, it's so powerful. At the same time, this movie is so joyous and full of lightness and exuberance and happiness. So how did you how did you all manage to find such positivity and such heaviness and darkness? I think it was just leaning a little bit into the personality of, of each of the poets. Like Tyrus is not saying it because he's here, but Ty Tyrus is hilarious, and and uh, he cracks me up every single time. Uh, and just like him, all the poets have they have a great sense of humor. They're like very plugged in with what's cool nowadays, so they 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 get it. And and I because I think because so many people, I mean, poetry is many times uh, dense and deals with serious subjects. And I think many times when people think about spoken word poetry, when people think about poetry slams, you do have, you paint, you can cock this picture of like someone spilling their guts out, which, which you know, does happen in the movie. Um, but we wanted those to feel earned and we wanted, we wanted to offer the spectrum of emotions that you can feel in a slam. Because there's also poems that are really funny. There's poems that are satirical. And and in order in order to really appreciate all of it, we wanted to lean in, in on the comedy. We have a fantastic freestyler, Austin Antoine, who plays uh, one of he plays Ra, um, and he, he improvised most of his scenes, and they're like the biggest laughs we consistently get in theater. So it, I think that it was just a, a part of of this community, all of their components, and just trying to make sure that we didn't. That we gave them a space to uh, just let loose in every every way. That's great, Tyrus. What was it like performing Home Part Two? Which time? I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I understand you guys had to take a couple of different uh, bites at that apple, right? Yeah, but I, for me, each time the thing about poetry is that it allows you to just like pull up emotions each time, especially because I feel like in order to perform a poem in the way that I specifically write poems in order to like perform it the way I want to, is I go back to that headspace of writing it, which can be both helpful and hindering at times. But I, the last time that we filmed it, that ended up being the take that was used, I really just like went, like I was telling it to my baby brother, who I miss so dearly and I it was a lot of emotions in order to do it and especially to do it on the street late at night with like a phone and I would say that it was just like a whirlwind of just like emotions because I wasn't on a stage like I wasn't uh getting immediately like that like a crowd of people being like oh my god we feel you it was just like I was left back in the position of when I wrote it of just like feeling like really isolated but then to go see it at screenings and see people like resonate with it so much, like just feels like like every bit of like my heart that I just felt like I had left in that. So I was just I afterwards, I'm just so honored that I was able to be honest with myself in a piece and not how I do a lot hide behind like, oh, I'm going to make a joke insert here. So. I was just really honored to be able to do that. Kelly, I think I read someplace that you talked about this movie uh, as being a love letter to Los Angeles. And um, I, I was wondering about that because it struck me like 
this is not a movie about this is this would not happen in this way in New York. It would not happen this way in Austin. This is an L.A. story. But what is it about? What is it about this that is particularly Los Angeles and why was that important for all of you? Um, well, I want to preface that by saying that yesterday, <laughs> Carlos told me that he hated when people go <laughs> say that it's alone that way. So. That's not true. Okay, forget I, forget right, I asked that. Forget I asked that question. We're gonna <laughs> no, move. We're gonna no, move along. That, no, 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 no. I just told her that I don't refer to it as that, but Kelly, you can refer to it as whatever you. Want. So thank you for calling me out. <laughs> um, but I think uh, Carlos has talked about this before, but. The movie for me, like watching it for the first time, and I had lived in L.A. I went to college here. I've been here since 2009. Um, and I really feel like I know the city. I feel like the city has, like, really broken me and then built me back up again. I feel like um, it has been represented in so many different mediums. Um, but watching Summertime felt like seeing the city in a new way, if that makes sense. And I mean, that says a lot more about the current state of representation than anything else. But I think that uh, for me, watching it just made me fall in love with L.A. again, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. It totally makes sense. It totally makes sense. I, I, I just got so giddy, you know, at the scene uh, that you shot in the, the, the kitchen in the Korean restaurant, you know, which is... Oh, it's just so, it's so amazing. That's my favorite. And I hadn't, I purposely didn't watch the movie for a long, long time because I wanted to enjoy it when we premiered it a few days ago. And that scene uh, really hit me hard. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's, cult it's yeah. cultural, it's generational. It's like, it's, it's hitting so many different things. It's just fantastic. And talk to me about talk to me about magic in the film. I love like red lipstick and that dance sequence just took my breath away. Holy um, crap. I yeah, I that's another one that really gets me every time. I mean, I I think it also most of it comes from like I I love magical stuff and I think all of the work that I've done has like this uh exhibits of that, but but this, this, I think, really came from the poetry itself. Like, I, because, because poetry is so descriptive, because po uh, poetry is so metaphorical, um, and you use so many images, and you, you know, I think the act of making poetry is just, just alchemy of, of finding meaning in things and digging a little deeper and, and finding beauty in, and all the stuff that's around us, that just felt like such a, a perfect opportunity for us to to do that visually as well. And, and you know, it's a fine line of how much we could do it and not make this just a, a you know, complete disaster. Not to say that it's not, you know, a, a minor chaotic kind of movie. But, but that I think that's the magic of it, the fact that, that it allows you to every scene you enter, every poet you meet, you sort of like discover a new language, you discover a new personality. The way that Tyrus communicates is very different from the way the next poet communicates. And some of them wanted to explore their scene through comedy. And some of them wanted to explore their scene through dance and abstractions. And some of them, like you, there's one poem that it's all a voiceover and it's just images of, of uh, their houses. Uh, and that was sort of by design the way we wanted the movie to work. Like we wanted to allow ourselves and the people who watched it to be surprised as as they went on this journey and to really not know what to expect. Um, so you know, it was it was a uh, it was challenging in parts when 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 we didn't know what to expect and we were trying to shoot this thing. But uh, so happy that we did it this way. Yeah, definitely. And I just love the hopefulness at the end, like everybody climbing on top of the limo. Just, it's just a, it's a, it's a gorgeous scene. Let's, um, let's see, let's take some questions. Um, let's see, let me cruise on over here. Okay, so this is not a question, but I have a couple of comments. One, the chemistry here is, is amazing. I can see why this film is great. Love letter to all four, four of you. And uh, Tyrus, your hair is giving me life. 
This is Christina <laughs> says this. <laughs> um, we already have a link uh, in the chat to Kelly's poem. So uh, thank you, Spencer, for finding that and posting it so quickly. Should we take a minute to all watch it together? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not going to put her on the spot like that. Kelly would never talk to me again. Uh, another comment: yes, This movie, cool. another comment: This movie is fantastic. A truly different cinema experience. If you haven't seen it, you must. Um, let's see. We have the link to the theaters. Previously submitted question: How strictly scripted was the movie? So I think we kind of know the answer to that, which is the poems themselves were written, but you largely crafted the narrative and the structure through yes. an amazingly chaotic process. Yes, uh, that is accurate. And previously submitted, oh, for Carlos, how long have you been a fan of poetry? And besides the poets in the film, oh, this is going to put you on the spot. Who are your favorite poets? Um, who? I... I think I really became immersed in the poetry world when I did blind spotting and it was through David, it was through Rafa, it was through like the whole Bay Area group of of uh like what do you call that community, Marcus? Do you call is there like Naka, Rafa, George, like just the Bay Area poets? Yeah, okay. The Bay Area poets. Uh, and then I moved to New York. I was there living for a few years, and I also sort of, like, became a, uh, I surrounded myself with poets, and I, I'm very good friends with a poet named Sarah Kay, who, I don't know if I would say she's my favorite poem, but I absolutely love her. Uh, Tyrus, you, you, uh, you love her, too. Um, Wait, who is this? I, I want to make a note to myself. Sarah Kay? Sarah Kay, uh, K-A-Y. B- Okay, Tyrus I, is having a bit of a, a reaction to her. She's fantastic. Um, she did a TED Talk like four or five years ago. She performed a poem um, that is gorgeous, and she's put a few collections since. Uh, is it is it cool? Will, will the spoken word community think I'm cool if I say Sarah Kay is my favorite poet? Yeah, okay. Sarah Kay. <clears throat> All right, perfect. And close, close second is uh, Helen Marie Tran. <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, are there any other unanswered questions here? Did we get through all of them? I think we got through all of them. That is amazing. And we're almost at the end of our time. This is. Oh. Can I do a quick? Can I do a quick PSA? Oh, please. <laughs> uh, Tyrus laughs at me every time I do this because I sound like a car, car salesman. But it's okay. It's okay. I'll be that person. Uh, no, just want to say for all of you out here who got a chance to see the movie and connected with it, um, I just wanted to remind you all that this is a, a very independent release. Uh, we have a gracious distributor who's really helping us and is wonderful. Um, but these kind of movies really do get to stick around only through word of mouth and if people actually show up to watch it. So if if you loved it enough to see it again, please come see it in theaters. Or if you don't want to see it again, send uh, someone who should see it. If you hated it, send someone you hate to see it. Point is, just make sure that people <clears throat> show up. Uh, if, you, we'd really if, you hate, it. if you hated the movie, you need to get to therapy because your soul is in need of assistance. I, I'll, just, I'll just put I'll just put it that way. We do have one late breaking will, question, Carlos. This is yes. about this is about blending timeline. So, like in one sense, it's literally one day, and at the same time, uh, your two rappers um, who I've, I forgot. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the Anubis and Ra. Anubis and Ra. They go from they, they go from being penniless street performers to world famous in the course of the day. So, can you talk about the just the magic realism of your timeline. I, I think we just, we wanted to allow ourselves to uh, make rules and then break them. And that's the reason why you have a musical number in the middle of the film. And that's the reason why the two rappers exist. Uh, I, and I think, you know, to some people, I feel like this, this could be like a, a little bit complicated or confusing, but 
we just wanted to really liberate ourselves from from having like any narrative rules and we we're just like look th this is po we're making a movie about poetry so just by definition it's going to be wacky and like let's not shy away from it and and that's really how how that particular storyline evolved and they really have uh their real life story involvement with the movie is very much like the one in the film really? they were last they were last minute additions we had our cast complete and then diane the woman who runs get lit was just like hey we have these two poets, uh, you know, they're musicians. So can you just, can they just be like performing in the background of some, some scene? And I was like, oh, we're full. Sure. Why not? All right. Uh, and then, and then we're like, oh, right. What's like, what are you guys going to be called? And they're like Anubis and Ra. And there's just so, such outrageous names. And they just, <laughs> they just started becoming sort of like an ongoing conversation. We're like, why don't we also have Anubis and Ra in the background of that other scene? And then little did you know, they became sort of like show stealers all throughout. And uh, I, I hope they, uh, hope they explode to intergalactic levels of fame. It's really, it's really true. Anubis and Ra are primary drivers of the narrative of the film. And also Tyrus just, you know, the man just wants a cheeseburger and that becomes like the primary driver of the narrative of the film, it feels like. So I'm so glad that that finally happened for you at Smiley's in a particularly delightful scene. Um, I just also wanted to give it a, a shout out to Andy Hay, who did the sound work and the mix Andy. on the film, which is really remarkable. I am sure Carlos, that you did not give him a lot of time or money to do the sound work on this film. And I don't know what would make you assume that because Andy got both, a lot of both of those things. All right, fair enough. Well, he did, he, he, did, he did a great job. Andy also did the mix on blind spotting, I think. Is, isn't that right? He did. He did. He's fantastic. Um, <laughs> this movie was messy, and the files that he got were too. And I can't believe that you can hear some of those scenes and you can hear them in a theater and they sound as beautiful as they do. Um, because Tyrus's poem that he recorded on his phone, we only recorded on his phone. Like, we didn't have a crew following him around with a boom mic. Like, he, the audio that you hear there is from iPhone 7 or whatever we shot it on. Uh, so you know, it's it was a it was a challenge, but I think he he took it and and ran with it and did a beautiful job. So thank you, Andy. All right, kids, if you're listening in, that is not a best practice that we uh, that we promote at Dolby uh, recording your production dialogue on the iPhone Seven. But uh, in certain it really, cases, this, it can work out. At this point, it doesn't even matter. And you know, it's like you put some filters on it and put in Dolby Atmos, and no one will notice and. No, no, I, I, blind spotting, I, I honestly think is like one of the best sounding movies ever, and it's only because of you guys. So thank you for all the amazing work that you do. Thank you, Carlos. We really appreciate that. Um, so I feel like this is not just a movie, but it's also kind of a social movement. So where are things going now with Summertime and with Get Lit? And are, are you continuing your involvement with spoken word poetry? We're trying. Marcus, do you want to maybe just do a quick uh, summary of things? Yeah, so uh, I'm running the Impact Campaign for Summertime right now, which has been uh, a whirlwind of an experience, but all good. Uh, so basically right now we're running free community screenings all throughout Los Angeles. Uh, tonight we're going to be having a screening at Carther Park if anyone is around town or has friends who are around town. Uh, on top of that, uh, the biggest thing right now is we actually had some of the poets from the film also come together to create a zine on how to help keep L.A. sustainable. Uh, and so we're passing those zines out uh, anywhere, everywhere we go. Uh, and I think the uh, the biggest, biggest thing and really the thing that has my heart, uh, my, I know you're not supposed to say your favorite child, but my favorite child uh, is this book, Summertime Odes to L.A., that I got to edit with two of my best friends, Mila Kuda and Hannah Harris. Um, and what's super dope about this is that it's an anthology of poetry, of beautiful artwork, as you can see. And every book that you buy, actually, like, money goes directly to the poets in the book, which is very different than most other anthologies. Most other anthologies, you just get a one-off check. 
uh, for this, yeah, every book you buy, you're like directly putting money in LA Poets pockets, which is fantastic. So if you want to keep supporting their work, please, please, please buy this book. If you want to really keep supporting it, uh, buy this book for yourself and for like your best friend. Uh, and then also, as Carlos said in his salesman pitch, uh, just tag us and everything. But for the most part, those are like Wait, the two Marcus. major things that we're doing. Yes. Where, where may one find this book? Yeah, where? You can go to summertimeodestola.com. Odes to LA.com. All right. Like that. Perfect. Okay. Now you have your call to action, everyone. Go buy this book. Yeah. <laughs> it's All a right, really well, good book, y'all. Well, the if it's anywhere near as good as the movie is, uh, I can't wait to uh, to take a look at it. I want to give a special thanks to the Dolby at Home team, who this is a project that was born out of the pandemic when we all couldn't come together. And uh, this has been just a remarkable series of programs. Nancy Gribbler, Tolly Maslin, Brian Dennis, and the amazing Brenda Chan. Thank you so much for putting this together. And then finally, summertime. Holy shit. What an amazing accomplishment. Thank you, Carlos, Kelly, Marcus, Iris. Thank you for joining us to talk about this unbelievably remarkable film. And congratulations on this success. Thank you so much, Glenn. I hope to see you very, very soon. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, until we all see each other again, bye-bye. So once again, I would like to thank Carlos, Kelly, Marcus, and Tyrus for joining us in conversation today about the film Summertime. If you haven't gotten a chance to see it yet, I really encourage you to go see it in a movie theater. It's in theaters right now. It is really, it's, it's a fantastic movie that just makes you feel good about life. And uh, it's, it's just a, it's a joyous experience and I hope you get a chance to see it. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have a ton of exciting episodes coming up in the next few weeks that you will not want to miss, especially our upcoming coverage of the Emmy Awards as we interview many of the nominees. Remember, you can always find links to our dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please consider leaving us a rating or a review on the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps raise awareness of our show so that we can continue to grow. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been the Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I am your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines. Thanks for joining us.